Matt Schaff and Jared Smola of DraftSharks.com here to talk coaching changes. Now, Jared, 16 teams changed head coach, offensive coordinator, or both this offseason. We ran through every single one of those in a recent article on DraftSharks.com. That's a free read, so you can check that out right now or whenever you have a chance. We are not going to run through all 16 of them on this particular video. What we are going to do is cover five of the most interesting situations and what that should mean for players that you will either be drafting or not drafting in fantasy this year. If you do want to get notified whenever we put out new content like this, hit that subscribe button on your screen or subscribe via your favorite podcast listening service. We're out here putting out stuff. We want you to, to find it. Jared, let's start our run through the top five with the Baltimore Ravens. What do people need to know about the changes there? Yeah, and this one I think might be the most impactful coaching change of the offseason in terms of run-pass split. So um, offensive coordinator Greg Roman out in Baltimore. Todd Munkin replaces him. Under Roman over the past four seasons, the Ravens have averaged a 48.6% pass rate. Todd Munkin's four NFL offenses averaged a 60.6% pass rate. That's a 12 percentage point gap. If you want to look at pass rate over expected, which we like to do, it sort of filters out, um, you know, game environment that might impact play calling. It looks at, you know, what a team would be expected to pass at and what they actually pass at. kind of gives you a better idea of their intention. Greg Roman's Ravens, negative 5.5%. Todd Munkin's plus 1.8%. So again, you, you can look at this multiple different ways, but the point being the Ravens are going to pass more this season under Munkin than they did under Greg Roman. How much more we'll see. More passing, obviously good news for Mark Andrews and the wide receivers. It would usually be excellent news for quarterbacks. I do wonder a little bit with Lamar Jackson, who obviously derives so much of his fantasy production from his running ability. And listen, he's, he's still going to run. I don't even think Munkin's going to go as pass heavy with the Ravens as he did in, in you know most of his, his previous stops. Again, we'll see exactly how, how pass heavy they go and how exactly that impacts Lamar's fantasy points. I think it's good for everybody because, uh, you know, Lamar Jackson runs a lot and that's always going to be key to his fantasy value. But a lot of his running also starts out as passing. And I think we're going to get plenty of that. He's a scrambler. In addition to being able to do design run stuff, he's not a huge quarterback, so he's probably better off scrambling than he is taking design runs. I don't think any OC is taking run pass options out of this offense, so I think that'll be part of it. And I, I think, Jared, this is one of those situations where we could, I don't know, get a little carried away projecting it because there's a lot about it that we don't know. We've got the new OC. We've got new wide receivers at play. So they've told us with what they've done this offseason that they're going to throw the ball more. I think our job is to not limit what the upside of that can be. We'll project it. I mean, you check our rankings now. There are projections for everybody. We have guesses, but there are so many unknowns here. I think it's important to include yeah. the, the ceiling and the floor projections and talk about what's the ultimate upside if this happens and if this other thing happens and, you know, not necessarily limit ourselves with those numbers. No, for sure. That's a great point. Um, definitely important to consider that upside. It's you know, just as important as the baseline projection for these guys, I think. Um, two, Just two final quick notes on Todd Munkin in Baltimore. One is I, I think it's safe to say the Ravens are going to play faster this season under Munkin. His offense is uh, in situation neutral pace, ranked 8th, 11th, 4th, and 28th. The Ravens under Greg Roman were 22nd or lower in pace all four seasons. So you're going to get more plays out of Baltimore. That's good news for everyone involved. The other thing we've heard out of Baltimore so far this offseason is that Munkin wants to get his running backs more involved in the passing game. That one I'm not buying so much. One, we know Russian quarterbacks like Lamar Jackson tend to target their, their running backs less. Lamar is going to take off and run rather than check down to his running backs. The other reason I'm not totally buying it is because Three of Munkin's four offenses finished with a running back target share below 16%. And NFL average is around 19%. Just Munkin's history, you know, the running backs haven't been a big part of this passing game. So, again, what we'll see, I'm not buying that narrative as of now. Um, you know, what we'll see in, in training camp and preseason if we can, you know, glean anything else. Yeah, I think it depends on how you choose to frame it. If you're saying, oh, they're going to be one of the most running back pass heavy teams in the league now, that's not going to be the case. But are they going to throw to J.K. Dobbins more than they have to running backs recently? 
I would say that's probable. And if you look back at Todd Munkin's offenses, most of them were Bucks teams with pretty crappy backfields. And then his Browns offense threw a good number of passes to the running backs with Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt. So, you know, I would say there's more. I think we we believe that J.K. Dobbins has the aptitude, aptitude to catch. So if he adds some there, it's going to help. Yeah. He hasn't been a target for me, but there's at least upside from where he's going. Next team up here is the Denver Broncos. And Jared, this might be the most notable change overall because the Broncos – had the failed Nathaniel Hackett experiment last year. He didn't even make it through one year as a head coach. Seemed like an unexciting choice at the time. They replaced him with Sean Payton. It doesn't get much bigger as a head coach name than that. 15 years leading the Saints. He spent three others before that as the Giants offensive coordinator before being with the Saints. Was also with the Cowboys in the meantime. Only his first and last offenses, if we take all of those 18 years, finished outside the league's top 12 in total yards. Three of his 18 finished worse than ninth in total yards. One of Peyton's 15 Saints offenses ranked lower than 12th in points. Now, there is not going to be any Drew Brees in Denver. We know that. Drew Brees was excellent for his time with the Saints. For that reason, we had the Saints as one of the league's more pass-heavy teams pretty much throughout Sean Payton's run there. They did lean run over the final few years. So I'm not sure that we know a whole lot yet about what to expect run pass wise. What they do have in Denver is Russell Wilson. And we don't know if that's good or bad yet. And that's kind of the key to everything here. Two years ago, Russell Wilson looked like he was still a very good player. Like at that point, he looked like maybe the closest thing still in the league to Drew Brees, a shorter guy, very accurate, very efficient. And then all of a sudden things exploded. Like even at the beginning of 2021, Russell Wilson got off to a hot start. He finished that season with 25 touchdown passes versus six picks. So that's a very good ratio. Lost about a quarter of that season to the finger injury. Then last year, Russell Wilson was just awful. So this year we find out, was it him? Was it the offense? Was it a combo of those things? We'll see. Sean Payton comes into this spot. He brings OC Joe Lombardi, who worked for the Chargers as the coordinator the past two years, worked with Sean Payton for 10 other years in New Orleans. So they know each other. And that's the key here more than any specifics with Joe Lombardi's offenses, I think. And then, Jared, we just have to watch and see what happens with Russell Wilson as we move toward the season. Yeah, to me, it's it's tough to overstate how big of a coaching upgrade this is in Denver, right? Like how bad Nathaniel Hackett was last year. I mean, Denver was dead last in points scored. They were 29th in football outsiders, offensive DVOA. You go from that to Sean Payton, who's just well established as, you know, one of the better offensive minds in the game. And like you said, we'll see what his offense looks like without Drew Brees. But like, even if Russell Wilson is washed up past his prime, whatever you want to say, like, I think the offense is going to take a step forward just because the the overall system and the play calling is going to be that much better. Wilson is the big, big question here. But again, I think the coaching upgrade is just massive. Can't get much worse than last year. How high it can yeah. go will depend on Russell Wilson. But all these pieces aren't going especially early. Russell Wilson's QB 18 and ADP in most places. They have plenty of receiving talent. Jerry Judy, Cortland Sutton, who I'm not a big fan of, but he's going in wide receiver four territory. Tim Patrick is back from his ACL tear. Greg Dulcich at tight end. Second round rookie Marvin Mims. Backfield, Javante Williams, we'll see about his knee as we get closer to the season. They brought in Samaje Pirine to at least help out there. So there's lots of talent on hand if Russell Wilson can rebound to any degree. I think, Jared, we'll have to watch and see what to expect on the run-pass split front. I think camp reports will help us. Maybe yep. preseason will help us. It doesn't usually help that much. But if we start hearing that this team is leaning run, I think that's a bad sign for what they expect from Russell Wilson, because this is a team that should lean pass yep. with a decent running game. Yeah. I think it's interesting. As you noted, Peyton did start to lean towards the run, like as breeze got older. And I think, you know, his game started to drop off at least a little bit. The saints were 20th or lower in pass rate in four of uh, Peyton's final five seasons there. So I, I think we kind of remember Peyton as this, you know, pass heavy play caller with breeze in his prime, but you know, he's definitely, shown a willingness to lean towards the run if that makes more sense yeah let's hope that russell wilson's good enough for that not to be the case anymore so are you already in or out on russell wilson as receivers you can let us know in the comments right now on youtube we'd love to hear from you for now though we're going to move on to the chargers jared what changed on that front beyond the oc i already mentioned followed sean payton yeah joe lombardi out as chargers oc kellen moore former cowboys oc in as the coordinator for the chargers joe lombardi catches a lot of flack caught a lot of flack like in our fantasy community and, and some of it is definitely deserved i want to start though by 
talking about a couple of the good things he did for the Chargers. The Chargers were sixth and fourth in situation neutral pace under Joe Lombardi, so he was playing fast. They finished seventh and second in total plays, so the play volume was there. And the Chargers were third and second in pass rate. Now, Lombardi, if you kind of look at his play calling, Benjamin Solak is one of my favorite X's and O guys. He did an awesome article. If you want to check it out, it's on the ringer. It was called The Chargers Offense is Failing Justin Herbert. And he just talked about all the things Lombardi was doing as a play caller that wasn't like that wasn't accentuating Herbert's skill set. And the one number you can point to that kind of confirms that Herbert's 6.4 intended air yards per pass attempt last season, that was 31st among 33 qualifying quarterbacks in the NFL. This big strong arm quarterback was just doing way too much short stuff. I think that's going to change under Kellen Moore. I think that's probably going to be the biggest change you see with the Chargers, just more downfield shots. Look at Dak Prescott's intended air yards per attempt over the past four seasons under Kellen Moore, 9.3 yards, 7.9, 7.7, 8.2. Again, Justin Herbert was 6.4 last year. So I do think you're going to see more deep shots uh, from the Chargers passing game this season. I think the Chargers are going to continue to play fast under Kellen Moore as they did under Joe Lombardi. All four of Kellen Moore's Cowboys offenses ranked top two in situation neutral pace. So pace should be there. Play volume should be there. I do wonder if the Chargers pass rate is going to come down a little bit under Kellen Moore. Again, the Chargers were super pass heavy under Joe Lombardi. Kellen Moore's four Cowboys teams, their ranks in pass rate over expected. 23rd, 20th, 9th, and 25th. Now, you know, the personnel is different there. They had better, at least deeper backfields. The wide receiver core wasn't even as good as what the Chargers have now. So I, I think Moore is smart and will pass more in LA than he did in Dallas. And I, you know, we don't, we're not projecting the Chargers pass rate to come way down, but we are projecting it to come down by a few percentage points uh, from, you know, what it was the past couple of years under Lombardi. Yeah, and they were way high in passing volume last year, but, you know, they just drafted Quentin Johnston in round one. They did bring in Kellen Moore as soon as he got dumped by Dallas, and basically what Mike McCarthy said in dumping him was, oh, he likes lighting up the scoreboard. I want to run the ball and save my defense. <laughs> well, we'll take the light up the scoreboard guy with Justin Herbert. And, you know, you pointed out the depth of target stat. That's certainly interesting. That's going to come down some when you have Austin Eckler as such a big part of the passing game because a running back is just not going to get as far down the field as wide receivers. I'm sure that it wasn't helped by games missed for Keenan Allen and Mike Williams along the way, but Quentin Johnson helps on that front, getting the ball further downfield, better health from the wideouts will help. And let's hope that the coaching change helps that as well, because I certainly agree that Justin Herbert's in a good spot to rebound his fantasy value. It was okay last year, but definitely well short of what he could have been. Jared, I'm a big fan of Justin Herbert where he's going in drafts right now. I think he's a strong value. Yes, he he's my most owned quarterback so far in drafts. I like the um, price to upside equation on him. And he's, he might be going a little earlier than you're used to as a seventh quarterback because all the quarterbacks are being pushed up, but we have to rate value versus the position where everybody else is going. Value above all else if we're following the Draft Sharks, um, drafting pillars, and that's where Justin Herbert fits. You can get him behind that top group of quarterbacks. I think he has just as much upside as everybody else above him. Dallas Cowboys are the next up on our list. The Cowboys, of course, are the ones who dumped O.C. Kellen Moore because he wanted to light up the scoreboard, according to Mike McCarthy. And, you know, if there's one thing you should hate, it's an offensive coach that wants to put a whole bunch of points on the scoreboard. Now, of course, what McCarthy means is not that he's scoring too many points. He seems to not like how quickly the offense operates. Maybe it's two downfield and he wants a bit more plotting. He wants to control the clock and let his defense rest. That's old guy thinking to me, but we'll see exactly what it means for the Dallas offense. They did replace Kellen Moore with Brian Schottenheimer. He was an offensive consultant for the team last season. He was QB's coach and passing game coordinator for the Jags in 2021 Seahawks offensive coordinator for three years before that Brian Schottenheimer reportedly split ways with Pete Carroll there because Pete wanted to run the ball more and Schottenheimer, I guess, did not. So we'll see what that means for Dallas because it sounds like McCarthy wants similar things. Not really going to matter a whole lot, I don't think, because Mike McCarthy is expected to call the plays. Jared, I think that we take it as kind of a negative. I'm not sure if it's a positive or a huge negative. And I, I think that our rankings so far don't really indicate that we're overly worried about CeeDee Lamb or Dak mm -hmm. Prescott. I know CeeDee Lamb, yeah. Especially, we have 
slightly above market in our wide receiver rankings. Yeah, the coaching change here isn't a major concern for me. I'm curious to see what we learn, you know, throughout August and in, in, in preseason action. Um, the McCarthy quote back in whatever it was, February or March, about, you know, wanting to run the damn ball so, we can rest my, so I can rest my defense. You look at McCarthy's history, though, as the Packers head coach, he, he was a pass-leaning play caller for the majority of that time. And the other note, the important thing to look at with Dallas, last year, Dallas was 22nd in pass rate and 25th in pass rate over expected. They were already a run leaning offense last year. So even if you expect them to be run leaning under McCarthy, like that's not going to be different than what we saw last year. My concerns with the coaching change are just the pace and the play volume. Cause we talked about how fast the Cowboys played under Kellen Moore, how many total plays they ran. They were top eight. The Cowboys were in total plays in all four seasons under Kellen Moore. Look at McCarthy's history. He has some seasons, with fast pace, but his three final seasons in Green Bay, the Packers were 19th or lower in situation neutral pace in all three of those seasons. Brian Schottenheimer's last three Seahawks offenses were 18th or lower in situation neutral pace. So I do expect the Cowboys to play a a bit slower this season and probably run fewer plays. So I think that's the concern. But again, from the, from the past run split perspective, I I don't think we're going to see much change at all on that front. Yeah, they passed on only 52% of plays last year. Of course, they lost Dak Prescott for five games to the thumb injury, so it makes it a little tougher to read. The two years before that, 59%, 61% pass rate with Mike McCarthy as the head coach. So they're probably going to actually run the ball a bit less than they did last year. Um, We'll see exactly how it, it pans out. Ultimately, I'm not adjusting anybody significantly. I think the change and watching how it plays out probably matters most for like Brandon Cooks and or Michael Gallup in terms of whether yeah. they can become yeah. regular lineup options. Like I said, we have CD lamb slightly above market Dak Prescott right around market value. Yeah. I'm with you there. You know, it, like if Dallas drops from fifth in total plays to, to 20, if it's kind of those fringy guys that are, that are going to be most impacted. Last team here, Jared, the Washington commanders. What do people need to know about this one? Yeah. Eric Bieniemy replaces Scott Turner as the commanders. OC, and that this, is a tough one, I think, to evaluate because we've had the enemy as the Chiefs offensive coordinator for the last five seasons. And obviously those Chiefs teams have been fast paced and pass heavy and they put a bunch of points. But, you know, it's Patrick Mahomes, a quarterback and even under head coach Andy Reid, who is, you know, has obviously a, a big part in that offense. So, you know, we could talk about the fact that the Chiefs were top two and pass rate over expected in all five seasons under B enemy, or the fact that they were, you know, top seven in situation neutral pace in all five seasons under B enemy, but we just don't know exactly how much to attribute that to him. And that's what make this makes this tough. Now I, I will say, you know, last year's commanders were 31st in situation neutral pace and 27th in pass rate over expected. So this was a slow paced run heavy offense. So like, Anywhere from there is up. And I do think they're going to play faster and throw more under B enemy. Exactly how much more, you know, that's, that's kind of the question we're going to have to answer. Why would Eric B enemy go from being chiefs offensive coordinator to Washington commanders, offensive coordinator? The answer is because he needs to get out from under Andy Reed and wants to show the league that he is a good offensive coach and not just a product of the system. We don't know yet whether that's the case. So we're waiting to see. I think the good thing for fantasy drafters, if you are intrigued by any pieces of this Washington offense, none of them are especially expensive. And I think maybe even more important than the change in coach is waiting to see what happens at quarterback. Like they're, they look like they want Sam Howell to be the starter in his second season. He's a fifth round pick from last year. So we have to temper expectations, but he was a very good college player that seemed like he was going to get drafted earlier than that. So There's some potential there. And if it doesn't pan out with him, they signed Jacoby Brissett for a lot of money for a backup. So he's clearly there as an insurance option and not simply a backup. So it's going to be interesting. Terry McLaurin is the highest drafted guy. Even he, though, is at a reasonable price, I think. And everybody else just comes down from there, Jared. I think this is a good offense to look at for chasing upside players in later rounds, which is another one of our main draft pillars. You can look at the backfield, Antonio Gibson, Brian Robinson, whichever one you like, or if you want to put both of them together in best ball, they're going late enough to be in play. And one guy that I've come around on throughout the best ball drafting process is Logan Thomas. One, because he has produced some in the past, but more so because he's going at the very end of draft. So if he does anything it's going to help us. And he's well positioned to get back into the target mix was one of the most prominently run in the slot 
tight ends last year. So if he does that under Eric Bieniemy this year and, you know, stays in the mix for targets on a regular basis, you know, he could be that guy that's not exciting, but gets four catches commonly and is going to find the end zone here and there. Yeah. Logan Thomas has definitely moved up our, our rankings over the past month or so. Um, he's not quite as old as I thought he was and he's healthy for now. Um, you know, he's had some injury issues, but he's healthy for now. And that's been one of the things we've heard about this the enemy offense so far. And, you know, the short time he, he's been in Washington is that, you know, he has been featuring the, the tight ends in the passing game. And obviously there's the Travis Kelsey comparison. That's probably, you know, foolish to make, but um, I don't know if he's bringing any of that system over to Washington like Logan Thomas is not Travis Kelsey, but if you know he's going to be, you know, similarly involved in the passing game, um, you know, he'd obviously be a big value at his current ADP. Yeah, and absolutely no risk where you're drafting him. So if you found some useful information in this video, please hit the thumbs up on your screen, give us a rating, give us a review wherever you're consuming the content, and subscribe to get notified every time we publish something new. Of course, to see the full analysis of all 16 coaching changes, head to DraftSharks.com right now.